happy Tuesday. Happy Tuesday. I'm Dr. Susan Blum and welcome back to my Tuesdays live, Facebook Live with Dr. Blum, lunchtime. Um, if you're eating, I hope you just are eating something really healthy and um, anti-inflammatory. And uh, thank you for bringing me into your lunch break and uh, letting me share it with you. So we've known each other now for, it's been, I've been doing this a few months already and so this has been really fun. And um, I've been on a sort of run of talking about autoimmunity. Uh, I suppose I'm an autoimmune expert since I wrote a book on it a few years ago. Um, and that's great. And I, it's a topic I really love. And, uh, and, and it's not just about autoimmunity. I really have, have uh, all the roots of autoimmunity. We do a lot of talking about that too, such as food and lifestyle and stress. So, so we do a lot more than just autoimmune discussions. And especially the gut has been on my mind a lot. Um, and so you've heard a lot of discussion about that. So today we're going to continue sort of the autoimmune discussion with lupus. And we talked about MS last week and RA the week before and Hashimoto's the week before that. So I've been doing this whole autoimmune discussion and part of it is, or I've been focusing on it these past four weeks, is because I'm proud to announce or just share that my book, The Immune System Recovery Plan, just went into its 19th printing, so we're at, at, at about 100,000 copies in print, and it's gone, um, and we re-released it. It's still in hardcover, and it's four years, so that's really awesome, and my publishers are happy, and so am I, but I re it, the book was re-released with an updated, sort of as an, I re-updated the book, and it was re-released just in February, and now it has a uh, 30, I did a 90 day or three month program that I added to the back of the book in the appendix, a whole section on three months, week by week, how to take the book and string it together. The four steps, he, food, stress, gut toxins. So in the book, it's four steps for healing your immune system. Food, using food as medicine, balancing your stress hormones and your stress system, healing the gut, and supporting your liver with detox. And the book takes you through those four steps in four parts in the book. But what I did was I circled back and I said, okay, let's just take it how I do it here at Blum Center. And let's take, offer someone a guided three month program where every week I tell you exactly what to do every week in three months, moving through those four steps in the program and, and sort of making it all seamless and putting it together. And so I gave that to my publishers and we re-released the book a few weeks ago. So in honor of that, I've been moving my way through different autoimmune diseases and sharing that on Facebook Live. Now, all the autoimmune, autoimmune diseases, as I um, talked about every time I have the opportunity to talk about them, and I'm pretty sure I talked about this last week with MS, is that what all these diseases have in common is greater than what separates them. And one of the reasons why we've had such, um, uh, we're so behind in the research for autoimmunity and, and immune health in general is because everybody ends up at a different place to treat their autoimmune disease. And the four I've covered is a perfect example. So Hashimoto's thyroiditis that I covered four weeks ago, people with Hashimoto's go to a endocrinologist for their hormones. That's who takes care of thyroid people. But the endocrinologist does nothing for the autoimmunity. They actually ignore it. You know, and just say, oh, don't worry about that. We're just gonna treat your hormones. Well, I worry about that because I wanna repair and fix the autoimmune part. Right. So that's the endocrinologist. The second group is RA. So R people with RA go to a rheumatologist. And actually the old um, term rheumatism you know, always stood for arthritis. You know, the, your grandmother had rheumatism in her joints, you know, and that's just joint pain and swelling and, and arthritis. And they went to and rheumatology, sort of that field. And then last week we talked about MS and people with MS go to a neurologist. And neurologists are really great for the nervous system, but they're not really immunologists that understand the immune system. And so that's the need to bring it all together in one place and talk about the health of the immune system and how to repair it and how to improve the health of the immune system. And if we repair the roots of the immune system, the autoimmunity repairs itself as well, no matter what kind of autoimmune disease you have. Now, today we're gonna to talk about lupus. 
Now, lupus patients, if you have lupus, this category also goes to rheumatologists. So this is the same as, as people with arthritis. So, so it's not actually, I made it at the very beginning when I said four different doctors, not quite three different doctors for the four things that we're covering. So, you know me, I always like to make sure to correct myself if I realize I said something that wasn't exactly truthful. No alternative facts here. <laughs> Only real facts, as much as I can be sure of them. And, um, and when I don't know something, I will always tell you. Um, anyway, no politics allowed. Uh, so, that's, that's, I'm trying to manage my stress system by not watching the news too much, but I'm having a really tough time with that. I'm watching way too much news. I feel like after 9-11 I did that. You know, after the Twin Towers came down, I was glued to the news for two years, even talk radio, you know, and the news on the radio in my car. I'm sort of back to listening to the news in my car again, and I really have to stop. It's like an addiction because it's not good for my stress, and it's affecting my sleep. So, um, whoops, my microphone, excuse me. Okay, anyway, that was my, my little sign to get off that topic. So back to lupus. So all these conditions are a little bit different, and today I wanna focus on lupus and how that's different than other autoimmune diseases, and, and sort of in honor of lupus and, and, as, and, under, and help everyone understand as a category that there's a, this whole other category called systemic autoimmune diseases. And what that means is that your immune system, for those of you who might not remember what it means to have autoimmunity, when you have an autoimmune condition, your immune system is, uh, instead of attacking the foe, it attacks friend. You know, it's like friendly fire. It's, it's attacking your own cells. And there's, we try to put most autoimmune diseases into two main categories. It doesn't always work this way so neatly, but humor me here. It's the simple, a simple way to look at it. There's autoimmune conditions that are very specific to one gland in the body, like the thyroid, and like MS, right? They're organ specific, we call it. And then there's grouping of autoimmune diseases that are system wide, systemic autoimmune diseases. And lupus is an example of one of them. And the reason why it's system-wide is because it basically is non It affects all the cells in the body. It, it pervades all the organs. And the reason why is because, the reason why this happens with a condition such as lupus is because the, the autoimmune response is against the, the cells, the nucleus of all the cells of your body. And so it affects everything. And so, it, and so, for example, it really affects the blood vessels um, that travel in every single cell of your body. You need every, every single organ, blood vessels, bring blood to everything, to every cell and every tissue. And so if your vascular system is affected, it's going to be system-wide. And so lupus uh, affects the vascular system, and that's why you can end up with damage in your kidneys and damage and skin rashes and damage in really every system, every organ of your body, and, um, and generalized inflammation and muscle pain and joint pain. And, 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 you know, people with lupus can get really sick. The kidneys actually are one of the first big concerns of things that happen first, but it can end up in your lungs and your heart. I mean, it's everywhere, and so people can get very sick. Um, because it's so system wide, and so as such, you know, lupus has its own whole category of um, of treatment and and an approach. But again, the things that trigger lupus are very similar to the things that trigger other autoimmune diseases, and it turns out. And so people say, well, how did you end up with lupus as opposed to something else? Like, what determines that? And that's where genetics often come in. Genetics, it's, genetics won't tell you that you're gonna have an autoimmune disease, but I believe that the same stressor can come into the body, the same triggers, the same gut imbalance, the same toxins, the same you know, hormone system, you know, issues, and based on your genetics, some one person will end up with lupus, and another person will end up with rheumatoid arthritis, and another person will end up with Hashimoto's. So it's not always, the same trigger can cause different diseases in different people. Lupus people tend to be, people with lupus tend to be, um, have their own pattern. So meaning um, more women than men in a much bigger rate. So 80% of lupus patients are women. There's a much bigger connection between uh, sex hormones, between estrogen and lupus patients and lupus. So 
as opposed to something like Hashimoto's where there's a lot more men th in, than lupus patients. It's, m it's much more even. Even though all autoimmune diseases are more women, um, the ratio like in rheumatoid arthritis is three to one women to men. In lupus, it's eight to one. And so it's understood that hormones like estrogens have a much bigger role to play in lupus. And so therefore, estrogen activity increases your risk of lupus and of developing lupus if you're susceptible genetically and can make um, your lupus worse. So people with lupus, women with lupus flare during pregnancy, during times, during their period cycles. After menopause, they tend to do better. So a lot of the approach to treating lupus is you know, get you to menopause, you know, let's get through, you know, the childbearing years, that's when you tend, the things could be worse. So it's younger, so it's worse in younger women. Women with lupus should never take hormone replacement therapy, and I also don't recommend taking being on birth control pills. So there's this hormone connection in lupus that's different, right, than other autoimmune diseases. It's really much, the association is the strongest in, in women with lupus. There are some men with lupus, but it's not as common. And so let's back, so, that, so that's just a little flavor about the different kinds of autoimmune diseases. So I guess uh, compared to other autoimmune diseases, and I do, we t uh, as you know, food, stress, gut toxins as triggers. For lupus people, women, lupus patients, I, I do look at their hormones um, as a fifth category that I don't do with an intention for treating their autoimmunity like I do with auto, other autoimmune diseases. Definitely for lupus, it's top of mind for me to always evaluate the, the um, hormone system, look at estrogen pathways, look at toxic estrogens in the body. Like, see, I thought I was talking about the gut today, but I'm on hormones. Who knew? You know, <laughs> I can't. Sometimes I don't know where I'm going to go, but I think this must be what, ever, what I'm supposed to talk about, so that's what I'm talking about. So um, for now, we'll go back to what's behind me about how to test for it and treat it, but I want to finish on hormones. Um, from a functional medicine perspective, it's not just about your estrogen levels that your doctor might be testing for you um, conventionally. It's about how well your, your, um, how well your body metabolizes and detoxifies your estrogens. Your, the estrogens in your body are a total of the ones you make in your ovaries and your own, your own estrogens, but there's something called xenoestrogens, and these are the estrogens from the environment. And it turns out that we are filled with them. We're bombarded by them. The, all those toxins that we're exposed to, like pl pesticides, plastics, we all know we have levels of these. They measure it in the cord blood of babies and in, you, in all humans. We all have levels of this in our blood. Um, these are considered environmental estrogens, and they're very strongly estrogenic in the body. They're even more estrogenic than your own estrogens. So the estrogen receptors are, in your body are bombarded by these kind of estrogens. And the body takes all the estrogens, your environmental ones as well as your own, my mic's still okay, um, as well as your own, and sends them to the liver for elimination and processing and detoxification. And your liver, your detox system, can actually have a choice to how well it does for metabolizing your estrogens. And this is where genetics come in. Some people are very genetically able to take and, and sort of render harmless all their estrogens and, and push them and eliminate them in a harmless way. Some people are genetically predisposed to taking their estrogens and making more toxic end products out of them, so-called the good and bad estrogen metabolites, we call them. And we do that testing here at Blum Center and in functional medicine. We can actually look at your estrogen metabolites and see how well you're doing. And this is a, this is a combination of, you know, um, this, the, how well you're doing is a combination of your genetics, how much your to how bad your exposure is to those toxic estrogens, and finally how what you're eating. If you're using food as medicine, like what's your diet like? Are you eating a detox diet, which I covered way at the beginning when we talked about food for the first few Facebook sessions? And so cruciferous vegetables, rosemary, um, antioxidants, they all are gonna help you so I'm going like this, it's like move your estrogens through your body so they end up out in your gut and you poop them out and they're rendered harmless and not influencing your, in, your immune system. Because too many of those toxic estrogens will actually influence your immune system in a bad way and increase your risk of something like, if you're predisposed, um, it will increase and make your lupus worse. Okay, so we work on many levels and so it's an example of functional medicine, you know, the analogy we use with functional medicine is, you know, each person's like a tree. 
you know, and we all have leaves. And all trees have roots. And so someone with lupus, the trees, some of the leaves are falling off of the tree, and we really want to repair the leaves. But in order to repair them, we repair them from the roots up. So we're really looking what what are all the roots that we need to work on to we call and I think of those as the triggers in order to grow vibrant health you know to bring those leaves to vibrancy and and improve the functioning of the immune system and so um, with someone with lupus with a woman with lupus especially we must must address um, your toxic and your hormone status in the body so we can come back to that when there are questions you know when if there are questions on this. Um, I am going to turn now for a second to what's behind me because I want to make, I want to circle back and talk about, you know, making a diagnosis of lupus and what it even means and how to know if you have it. I have a lot of people that come into my office and they're really confused because somebody told them, well, you have a positive ANA and you're going to have lupus someday, but you don't have it yet, so see you later. You know, just keep coming back and checking back. This is a classic sort of rheumatology visit. I don't feel great, I fatigue and I'm like I'm weak and my muscles hurt and my joints ache and I don't quite feel right. Uh, what's wrong with me? And they come back with a positive ANA and the rheumatologist or another doctor, sometimes it's a primary care doctor, says, don't worry, well actually if you have a positive ANA, the doc your primary doctor will send you to a rheumatologist and they might do a whole workup and find nothing else. And they'll tell you, you don't have lupus yet. Um, usually that's what they'll tell you, but to come back and, uh, and we expect you're going to have it. Sometimes people come back actually and say, they, they come to me and they say, my, I went to see a rheumatologist and they told me I do have early lupus based upon just the ANA and my symptoms. And sometimes it's arthritis as the first symptom. And so I want to take you through the labs for a second to help you sort of understand this because I do believe the importance of early detection. This is where, you know, I'm a preventive medicine specialist, so I am always doing screening tests and I love early detection because that's when we have the easiest and best way to change this and to turn that ship around and for a complete cure before you end up down sort of the rabbit hole with a lot of with medication and irreversible damage to your joints or other, other organs of your body. And so we do want to um, treat early. Now you can see that there's something called an ANA, and that's an anti-nuclear antibody. And think about that for a second. N nuclear means the nucleus in your cell. Every single cell in your body has a nucleus. And so an anti-nuclear antibody is system-wide. It means you're making your immune, you're having an immune reaction to every, basically every cell in your body. And the problem with that is that could be potentially devastating. Right? It's sort of non-specific though, because it's just every cell instead of a particular targeted sort of grouping of cells. And so and so an ANA we consider a screening test, which means we, it's a first pass. It's the first thing you do just to screen. If it's positive, then you decide what then we have to decide what does that mean when you have a positive ANA. And there's two things it could mean. The first thing it could mean is that this is an early detection of what's going to be what we call a rheumatic disease. And actually, I should have written that rheumatic disease, such as lupus. First screening for rheumatic disease, such as lupus, but there are other rheumatic diseases like um, polymyositis, scleroderma, systemic sclerosis, dermatomyositis. These are system, system wide ANA positive diseases. And Sjogren's syndrome is also considered an ANA positive. It's usually associated with a positive ANA. So you pick up a positive ANA and you go looking for these other um, conditions. So Sjogren's is one of them, which is why people with Sjogren's, even their dry eyes and dry mouth is the most common thing. They show up with muscle pain and joint pain and it's elsewhere in the body because it's system-wide autoimmunity in a, to a lot of cells. Now. So if someone comes in and they have a, I, do, I screen and do an ANA on every single person that comes in as a new patient. And so it's part of my annual physical. You can, if you have ongoing sort of chronic, not feeling right, um, muscle, whether it's muscle pain, joint pain, extreme fatigue, or my, you know, any kind of fatigue, um, really difficulty concentrating, anything inflammatory that feels like it's in your body, that you just feel something's not right, 
ask your doctor to do an ANA screening. And it's just a general screening for autoimmunity. And if you come up positive, don't panic. Because a lot of people come in and say, oh my God, I had a positive ANA, I have lupus. And, the, and that's actually not necessarily true, and here's why. An ANA positive, what that does, it says, okay, we're now going to test you for lupus. And in order to be diagnosed with lupus, you need to end up with one of these other antibodies that are positive. You then go do the under the cert, the next layer testing. There's something called an RNP test, test, a Smith, and a double-stranded DNA. And you go and do those tests, and if any of those are positive, then I believe you can be given a diagnosis of early lupus, but you don't have actual lupus unless you have, sh you have clinical symptoms of lupus like I, like I expressed already. Joint pain, kidney damage, um, muscle pain, fatigue, you know, a series of, you know, where you really have symptoms, the clinical picture. But if you have any of those tests are positive, then I think you can be given a diagnosis of early lupus with a cons very early, preclinical, with the concern that you might advance into lupus and that's the time to read my book and that's the time to come see a functional medicine person because we could help you feel better and resolve those antibodies before you end up with lupus to prevent you from developing lupus to begin with. So early detection by, by blood work is really, really important. So a lot of conventional docs don't really know what to do with people with those early sort of symptoms. But you can ask for a referral to a rheumatologist if you, if you are concerned or if your doctor doesn't want to do an ANA test themselves. So a rheumatologist is the place to go or a functional medicine person like me. But I want to come back here for a second because a lot of times people have a positive ANA and I see this probably, probably at least half of my patients where I pick up a positive ANA by my initial screening are normal for rheumatic disease and they end up having no sign of lupus or any other autoimmune test that's positive, and that's called rheumatic disease. Instead, they have an ANA because they have an infection. And so think about it, a virus like Epstein-Barr virus is probably the most common reason somebody has a positive ANA. So for my patients who have an ANA that's positive, I go back and I do testing for, mono, for the old monovirus, which is Epstein-Barr. And the reason is because Epstein-Barr virus has been associated with triggering, actually it's, it's thought to be one of the triggers of lupus to begin with because people with um, Epstein-Barr virus often have a positive ANA. And the reason is because if you think about it, um, the Epstein-Barr virus lives in the nucleus of every cell of your body. It likes, it likes surface cells better, like epithelial cells, the cells that line things, so blood vessels, um, throat, which is why with mono you get a terrible sore throat, but, it, um, but the Epstein-Barr virus lives in the nucleus, and the ANA is an anti-nuclear antibody. So if you have a virus that's hiding in your nucleus, your immune system wants to get there. It's trying to get that virus, and so it's, it's attacking the nucleus of your cell to try to get at that virus. And so sometimes somebody with a positive ANA, it's just because they have active mono. And so many times people think mono just happens when you're young and it never, and it goes away. Oh, I had that in high school. Who cares? Well, it turns out that we care. Did you, I'm almost. You're okay, no question. Okay. It turns out that um, a lot of times, first of all, a lot of times you might have had mono and you don't know it. A lot of people never knew they had it, but 95% of the population, it has a positive blood test for showing they were exposed. So many of those people never knew they had it, but you were exposed because somebody in your family had it or something. So the Epstein-Barr virus, which we all think is in the past, can reactivate because Epstein-Barr virus never leaves your body. You have that baby forever. And it lives deep inside your cells and it's supposed to be in remission. Your immune system is supposed to drive it into remission and it hides and it's not supposed to come back out. Well, if it stays hidden, then you won't, your immune system won't worry about it because it won't really see it, it'll be hidden. If for any reason your monovirus decides to re-emerge, then your immune system will see it again and you will become and your immune system will become active to try to fight that monovirus and that's when you can develop the positive ANA. 
And there's ways to test to see if your Epstein-Barr virus has re-emerged and reactivated. We call it chronic active Epstein-Barr virus. And the most common reason that it reactivates is stress. Stress and trauma, you know, traumatic events, something really terrible or ongoing severe stress. Stress suppresses you, the, the part of your immune system that fights viruses. And the Epstein-Barr virus can come back out and reactivate. Sometimes people get re-exposed re to another infection, and that's certainly possible. But in my experience, it's because of reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. So I usually then circle back and test the Epstein-Barr, and you can actually do tests. It's called an early antigen test, or the IgM you can test for. Again, there's a panel of four different markers for Epstein-Barr. Two of them are um, suggest it's old, and two of them suggest it's reactivated. So there is a way to look at that. And, when I f and often I will find reactivated Epstein-Barr virus. And when that happens, to fix the ANA, I go after treating the, the Epstein-Barr virus. And to treat Epstein-Barr virus, I do many, well, we do, I do a whole bunch of things. But one of the first things I do to repair the immune system is repair the gut. So I'm back to the gut again. I'm not really trying to always come back to the gut, but 70% of your immune system lives in the gut. And so if you have chronic ongoing Epstein-Barr virus or you have lupus, because step three of my book is healing the gut and I give all that information about how leaky gut is associated with autoimmunity. And part of the problem is that, you know, with the immune system isn't working right. And one way that could show up is dysfunction and the immune system, tell me when I have two minutes. You do, and one more question. Okay, I'll wrap this up, and there's a question. Um, is that the immune system um, isn't working right, and you can then, it can become an autoimmune immune system, or it could not work right, and, not, and then the viruses come out, and that triggers the autoimmunity. So, most important point, and then I'm gonna a answer the question. If your ANA is positive, make sure you, you do all these tests to see if you actually have the lupus markers. If you do, go back and look at my book, Food, Stress, and, and look at the series I've been doing. You can do all this on my Facebook post. I did food already. We've talked about stress. I have been did a whole series on healing the gut. I don't know if I did detox yet. I think I did at the beginning with food, but we'll do more about detox. But, um, but you must do the autoimmune piece, right? And repairing the gut. I'm actually all about repairing the gut these days, and I have a whole online program for that at HealMyGut.com. Sorry, Blum Health MD. I said that didn't sound right. BlumHealthMD.com, and the program is Heal My Gut. And so start there, repair the gut. And if you have chronic Epstein Barr virus, you actually have to start there as well. But you can try to get the testing. And I just will say before I finish, it's not always Epstein Barr. You can have a positive ANA from Lyme and from other viruses that are in your body. But you always have to make sure your immune system works great. So repair the gut is a place to start. I also do use mushrooms and immune boosters, high dose vitamin A, I mean, I do other things. There's Epstein-Barr virus protocols with Byron, it's called Byron White with droppers to, for treating Epstein-Barr. I'll do that another day. So maybe we'll do that Facebook Live another day. Um, so and if you want me to, then you can post that and ask me to talk more about that. So that's it for today. I'm gonna just answer my question and then we're gonna close up. Yeah. Uh, this person's main question says, does your incorporating your autom autoimmune protocol lifestyle generally reduce blood antibody levels over time in lup lupus patients or in potentially any autoimmune patient for that matter? Well, absolutely. Um, so the question, well, you probably all see it posted and written. Um, my goal is actually to watch those antibodies drop. So I, I, I'm, I'm always working at getting the antibodies down. So absolutely, using this approach, we're going for a cure and a reversal of antibodies. And I've seen that happen. Now, what I will tell you, though, is that so you don't get discouraged. Um, that doesn't happen as, so there is a drop that I often see right away, but complete, for the, for the antibodies to completely disappear, that takes time. And sometimes the antibodies are sort of stay low level and, go, and don't go away completely. But what I will tell, and I have a few people that I can see they're still lingering and we're still working on, but they've come down substantially. The most important thing to focus on is how you feel. And what I'll tell you is the symptoms are, we work and the symptoms start resolving and people start getting down on medication within the first three months, six months, nine months, that happens very, more quickly 
or sooner than the than seeing the resolution, the complete resolution of the antibodies. I actually think it takes a long time, especially in lupus, for the antibodies to completely resolve because there's you know, whether it's Epstein-Barr virus or just the immune system, but, you know, antibodies live for a long time. And that sort of train that's been, you know, pummel, you know, traveling, that's been plowing through the station or just that ongoing um, uh, immune memory that the body has can last for a while. So you will feel better way before the antibodies go away. But yes, I created this program just so that you can watch those antibodies resolve. And so with that, any more questions, let me know. If I triggered any sort of interest for, or any ideas for what you want me to talk about in the future, please uh, post, post it in the comments and we will take that into sort of, um, I will take that into uh, consideration for the next Facebook. So have a great week, everybody. Um, enjoying March transition into spring. It's still freezing here, but we're getting there and the days are getting lighter. And um, I will see you all next week.